historically, go back almost five centuries to the era of the Protestant Reformation in Europe. The beginning point of this Reformation is often considered to be the year 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church, that eventful day of October 31. Unrest, renewal, and protest, sometimes actual revolt, were part and parcel of these social and religious stirrings. The Anabaptist movement had its origins in and around the city of Zurich, Switzerland, in the early 1520s, as part of the 16th century Reformation. In the distance, we see the twin towers of the Grossminster. In front of the Grossminster, we see the Rathaus, or Town Hall, on the banks of the Limmat River. Called to lead the emerging reform movement in the year 1519, Ulrich Zwingli attempted renewal by preaching directly to the people from the Bible in their own Swiss-German language. This abrupt change in worship patterns also signaled new hopes for spiritual revival, based on the way of Jesus in the Gospels. Zwingli drew a large following among them, those who would shortly become the leaders of the Radical Reformation, better known as the Anabaptist Movement. By 1525, some of Zwingli's followers were convinced that something was amiss where the state took on the authority to control the church. These followers, wanting to remain true to the primary authority of Christ as Lord, decided to disobey the state in order to remain obedient to Christ. Somewhere on the Neustadtgasse, exact location unknown, was the house of Felix Mantz. It was here that the first Anabaptist baptisms took place on January 21, 1525, in defiance of the government decree against the young movement. The first person requesting baptism was Georg Blaurock. Blaurock, in turn, baptized all the others present. In later years, as a missioner, he may have baptized Jakob Hutter near St. Lorenzen in South Tyrol. The original core of believers were of one mind about the nature of the body of Christ. 
It was based, they believed, on a conscious gathering together of those who personally desired to follow Christ, whom they saw as the Prince of Peace, attempting to witness to and live out a life of love and reconciliation with one another, and indeed with everyone in this world, accepting suffering as Jesus had done, rather than to respond in retaliation. Known as the Swiss Brethren, they attempted also to meet the spiritual and physical needs of one another mutually and to reach out to others in need. The baptisms on January 21 were in defiance of the decree just issued by the town council in which they gave the Anabaptists eight days to rejoin the state church, to have their children baptized, and to cease any further discussion regarding the nature of baptism and communion, or else to abandon their homes and leave town. In this farmhouse, home of the farmer Rudy Toman, his family and his hired servants, on January 25, 1525, an additional number of persons were baptized into the now illegal movement, and the first Anabaptist congregation was enlarged. Shortly thereafter, nearly all of the members were imprisoned, released, but only to be imprisoned again and again. From the moment of their founding, the government set out in earnest to persecute the members of the community. On this small scrap of paper, a prison keeper has written down, perhaps to remind a person on the next shift, perhaps as a reminder to himself, that he has once again locked up Grebel, Mons, and Blaurock, and had placed them on water and bread in the dungeons of a tower the Neuenturm, on the city wall near the Grebel home. The imprisonment of Anabaptists continued. Nevertheless, the movement kept on growing. So by December of 1526, the government decided to institute the death penalty for Anabaptism. Anybody who had joined the illegal movement was automatically subject to the death penalty, and no further trials would be necessary. One of the persons they happened to have in prison after the death penalty was instituted was Felix Mons. And on January 5, 1527, Mons was taken from the prison to this place called the Schipfke. He was accompanied by the executioner and by some members of the Grossminster clergy. He was taken to a little boat landing, put in a boat, and in the middle of the Limot River they placed a stick over his elbows and under his knees. Then they took a rope and tied him up into a little ball, and there, on that icy afternoon at three o'clock, he was held under the water of the Limot until he drowned. His body was fished out of the river and was buried outside the walls of the St. Jacob's Cemetery in Zurich, because the people felt, the government felt, that the holy ground of a cemetery should not be desecrated with the body of a heretic. A fascinating character in the Anabaptist movement was Georg, or George, Blaurock. Actually, that was not even his name. His name was Georg Kayakob, which means Georg from the house of Jacob. He was named Blaurock, blue coat, because people recognized him by the blue coat he often wore. He came from that part of Switzerland where Latin, the language of Julius Caesar's legions still survives, in the local version called Rätisch, one of Switzerland's four official languages. The execution of Felix Mons and the exiling of George Blaurock that same afternoon, when Blaurock was chased out of town by an angry mob of people, urged on by the police, did not stop the movement. Instead, we see that due to the fact that our people were forced to flee, the movement continues to spread. Our Anabaptist ancestors began to travel along the main trade routes and along the rivers of Europe, taking their message of a believer's church community from place to place. They proclaimed a spiritual yet literal community composed of Christ's disciples attempting to live out Christ's gospel of peace in spirit and in truth. This stood in sharp contrast to an uncommitted state church Christendom. And within years, the movement had spread through Central Europe. In fact, 
The enemies of Anabaptism claimed that Anabaptism spread like wildfire. Banished from Zurich, Blaurock began his missionary travels through Austria and northern Italy, establishing numerous fellowships on the southern slopes of the Alps. This picture shows the Pustertal. Brunick, another South Tyrolean site of Blaurock's activities, as an Anabaptist missioner. One of the places where Blaurock witnessed was St. Lorenzen in South Tyrol, the birthplace of Jakob Hutter. Only recently has Jacob Hutter's birthplace been identified, just outside of the village. It was Hutter who continued Blaurock's life work after Blaurock himself was tortured and executed in the summer and fall of 1529. The plaque reads as follows. In this house was born Jakob Hutter. He was the foremost leader of the Tyrolean Anabaptist movement. He died on February 25, 1536, in Innsbruck of Austria, by being burned at the stake as a martyr for his faith. Plaque mounted February 25, 1986. The name Hutter, translated into English, means hat maker. The building in which Jakob Hutter presumably went to school. Silhouetted against the sky, we see only part of the ramparts of Gufidown, the last hiding place of Georg Blaurock. Today, the village of Gufidown is known as Gudan, and the rushing Vilnos River is now called Rio Funes. All of South Tyrol was annexed by Italy after World War II. Georg Blaurock was eventually captured by the authorities and taken to the Somersberg Castle in Gufidown and kept in a dungeon chained to a large block of stone so he could not possibly escape. Escape was impossible anyhow because there were many soldiers sleeping on the hatch that would let him in and out. At the time of Blaurock's imprisonment, the only entrance into the dungeons was from the top of the tower. The door shown here was constructed only in later centuries. This large rock, to which Blaurock was chained, approximately two feet or sixty centimeters across, can still be seen today. Later, Blaurock was taken to the city of Clausen, today Chiusa, Italy. There he was tortured, tied to the stake, and burned on the city square. But even as he was being prepared for his execution, Blaurock still managed to preach to the people during the last moments of his life, and as a result, many people joined the Anabaptist movement. The execution of Georg Blaurock and many others out of our communities, on orders of the German Emperor Charles V, caused our people to undertake the long and arduous trek to Moravia, where they hoped to find the freedom to exercise their faith and to live in peace. Nicholsburg, today Mikulov, a city and domain on the main road between Vienna and Brun, Bruno, Moravia, became known as a haven of tolerance to the oppressed Anabaptists. By 1529, more than 12,000 refugees had found their way to Nicholsburg and vicinity. A century earlier, Moravia had experienced an earlier Reformation, that of Jan Hus and the Bohemian Brethren, and so the soil was prepared for the arrival of these Anabaptist radicals. Thousands and thousands of persecuted Anabaptists arrived from Switzerland, Austria, and northern Italy, as well as from southern Germany, to find freedom there. The new arrivals were able to work out land rental agreements with the lords of the domains in Moravia. And for a brief time, approximately 90 years of their history, the Moravian Anabaptists lived relatively unmolested. In 1528, a group of 200 Anabaptists, the non-resistant Stabler or staff carriers, separated from the larger group at Nicholsburg, the Schwertler or sword carriers, who justified defensive war as a Christian principle, and moved to Austerlitz. On the road, the Stabler group pooled all its earthly possessions, 
and so gave birth to commutarian Anabaptism. The movement soon spread from Austerlitz to nearby Auschwitz and Rositz. The commutarian Anabaptists were reorganized by Jakob Hutter, 1533-35, through a careful attention to Ordnung, corporate orderliness. This is a major clue to the ongoing success of this faith community. Balthasar Hubmeier, a former Catholic priest from Waldshut on the Rhine, on the northern border of Switzerland, arrived in Nicholsburg in July 1526 and was for some time the leader of the large Anabaptist community there. Hubmeier, the leader of the Schwatler, believed in defensive war and was not opposed to paying war taxes that went for fighting the Turks, who were in the process of overrunning Eastern Europe then, and would occupy the land for several centuries. Hübmeyer was executed in Vienna on March 10, 1528. The new mill at the village of Neumühl, Moravia, was the hub of the extensive Hutterian network of Haushaben during the Golden Years. Two cornerstones show the dates 1779 and 1751, an early cornerstone on the oldest part of the mill dates back to circa 1506. One of the two original Hutterite buildings, a distillery for medicinal purposes. The second of two original Hutterite buildings, where alcohol was stored, sold far and wide for medicinal purposes. In the heart of Innsbruck, we find the Gildenes Deckel, little golden roof, built in 1494 for Austrian Emperor Maximilian as an observation balcony against an otherwise plain building. The emperor used it as a reviewing stand from which to observe the entertainment in the streets below. The Geltner Steckel, designed by Schwabian artist Niklaus Turing, is covered by more than 3,400 gold-plated tiles and decorated with delicately sculptured scenes relating to the life of Maximilian and his two wives. It was also the place from which to observe public executions. Torture was widely used to extract the correct confession from religious dissenters. The cruelest of methods were widely used by Catholic and state church Protestant authorities to bring their citizens in line with the officially accepted confession be it Catholic, Lutheran, or Reformed. Immediately below the famous balcony, we find a plaque with the following inscription. On the 25th of February, 1536, Jakob Hutter, leader of the Anabaptists in Tyrol, was burned at the stake at this spot. Another former Hutterian Haushaben, still in existence, the Hutterites introduced vineyards into this general region. Today, Seitz remains as a major wine-producing center with large storage caverns. The Thirty Years' War wiped out the whole of the more than 100 Moravian Haushaben. The majority of Hutterites died from the direct and indirect ravages of this war. Under pressure, some converted to Catholicism to save their lives. A few fled to Sabatish, Sobotista. Here a certain religious toleration continued into the 18th century. Pictured is a typical Hutterite dwelling. Another view of this well-preserved Hutterite community of Sabatish. Sabatish was the home to Andreas Ehrenpreis, Andreas Ehrenpreis was the Vorsteher of the Hutterite Brotherhood from 1639 to 1662. Ehrenpreis compiled many of the community's regulations or codes, Gemeindeordnungen, covering the various facets of community life as formulated through the 16th and 17th centuries, and added some of his own. Here we see Ehrenpreis's Zenbrief. This title page of a codex, written in 1577, illustrates the artistic penmanship of the scribes among the Hutterites. 
shown here, is Frau Chetter of Altenmark, Bretschlaf Stara, in the Czech Republic, a direct descendant of the Hutterites. This photo dates back to the 1970s. In the spring of 1570, Veit Urmacher and a fellow missioner, Veit Schelch, after completing their mission, were heading back to the Hutterite colonies in Moravia. Their presence in the region was known, and a price had been set on their heads. When the two stopped in Wald for a meal at the Walderwirt Inn, some local peasants suspected that these were the wanted men. When the two gave thanks before eating their meal, the peasants knew for sure and called the sheriff. While the innkeeper stood guard, the sheriff arrived, along with several officers. Together, they led the prisoners to the dungeons at Mittersel, 14 miles or 23 kilometers to the east. From there, they were hauled off to Salzburg, where the bishop kept them in the dungeons for three years before they were ever questioned. At his trial, Urmacher contended that true faith shows up in a good Christian lifestyle and pointed out that the Catholic way of life at that time was hardly Christian. Urmacher escaped from prison in 1576 by tying together old rags. He went on many more missionary journeys before his natural death in 1586. The guest house Walderwirt has been in business continuously ever since the mid-1400s. This photo shows the low-ceilinged entrance hall and the winding stairway to the banquet rooms upstairs. The castle of Mittersil, where Veit Urmacher and his companion Veit Schelch were confined in the spring of 1570. The Mittersil dungeon, where the Hutterite missioners, Veit Urmacher and Veit Schelch, were imprisoned. Still visible are the hooks in the wall to which the prisoners were chained. In the Forder House, close to the Mittersil Castle, is where the sheriff and his wife lived. This couple were secretly sympathetic to the Hutterites and tried to at least provide them with good food while the prisoners were in their custody. The city of Marburg on the Lahn River in central Germany was from the beginning a center of Anabaptist activity. High above the city itself we find, side by side, the castle and cathedral, symbolizing the close relationship between church and state. In this castle, Peter Riedemann was imprisoned for many years. Fortunately, Prince Philip of Hesse was a tolerant ruler and treated his prisoners with respect. Peter Riedemann was in fact provided with pen and paper and was able to write his significant statement, his Rechenschaft, while in prison. For his tolerance of unofficial religious viewpoints, Philip of Hesse was despised by the rulers around him. Prince Philip did say once that it was not right to kill people just because they held to a different faith. Peter Riedemann, working on his Rechenschaft while imprisoned in Marburg. Around 1530, this spiritual giant had written his earlier Gmunden Rechenschaft, Love is Like Fire, also while in prison. Both confessions are based on a deeply spiritual faith founded on the very spirit of Christ himself. If there was any religious tradition that based itself squarely on the reality of being born again spiritually, of the new birth in Christ, it certainly includes the Hutterites. Today, with outside forces attacking our tradition and faith, this fact needs to be underscored and documented in some detail. Here is what Peter Riedemann says in the official Hutterian Confession of Faith. Quote, Since we are to be born of God in the spiritual way of Christ and not in the human way of Adam, we must carefully consider how the birth of Christ took place. It occurred in faith and through the working of the Holy Spirit. Whoever wishes to have Christ's nature and character must also be born of God that person must, with Christ, be God's child. This is what Peter says with the words, You have been born anew, not of mortal, but of immortal seed, and this seed is the word of truth. 
Here is how this birth takes place. If the word is heard and believed, then faith is sealed with the power of God, with his Holy Spirit. The Spirit immediately renews the person after that person has been dead in sin, restoring to life the one who stands before God in righteousness. That person has been made into a new creature, a new person after God's likeness, and has become renewed in this likeness. Whoever is born in this way should receive baptism as a bath of rebirth. This signifies being inscribed in the covenant of the grace and knowledge of God. From the Confession of Faith, page 110. Again, quote, The Spirit leads people into all truth, motivating all they do and fulfilling God's will. In that way, people begin a new life in the power of God. Paul says, whoever is in Christ is a new creature. Where does that knowledge and good conscience come from? It only comes from a heart awakened through the word of God. God will cause the word to flourish and to increase in a person. He will uproot all that is carnal and implant what is godly. From that originates the new birth of which Christ says, Unless a person is born anew of water and of the Spirit, entrance into the kingdom of God is not possible. The meaning of that is that whoever is instructed by the word of God and believes it will have his faith sealed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Through that, one is renewed or born again and led into a holy, godly life that person may then receive the water of baptism as a sign of the death of the old self. Riedemann's Rechenschaft, or Confession of Faith, was accepted by the Hutterite Brotherhood and published soon thereafter, around 1542. It remains the central source of guidelines for Hutterian faith and life to this day. Part 1 is comprised of many short essays on matters of faith and practice, Part 2 is the finest treatment of biblical theology from an Anabaptist perspective to have been written in the 16th century. It is entitled, quote, The God of Grace and His Separated People, unquote. This wonderful description of faith and life, based so carefully on the whole Bible from the perspective of Christ, centers in the new creation of Christ as exemplified by his church of grace and love, where vengeance dare not abide, and where non-resistant love always needs to fill the void and emptiness of human existence, transforming it into the meaningful life in the Spirit, as lived out by our Lord the Christ himself. One of the best preserved Hutterite settlements is Gross Schützen in Slovakia, today known as Velka Levare. In the early 1990s, the government started a partial restoration of the Habana buildings, a process still underway. The word Habana has possibly derived from the term Haushaben, or common household. One of the most striking buildings in the village of Grosschützen is the house of Josef Herdl, the potter. Note the straw roof of the type still found here, as well in Zabatish. This booklet, entitled A Description of the Habana Straw Roof, published in 1772, contains several fold-out pages which show the steps in making a long-lasting and to a certain extent fire-retardant straw roof, such as the one shown in the previous photo. This fold-out page from the straw roof manual, shows how the straw was treaded in a box with clay prior to being installed on the house. The Hutterites became famous in the year 1570 and for decades following for their beautiful pottery, and even their arch enemies purchased these graceful Hutterite works of art and willed them to their descendants. A majority of these pieces, now found in museums, are dated. This photo shows a Habaner dish undated. This is a six-sided Habaner screw flask, 
dated 1663. This type of container was used to contain healing medicines and ointments used by traveling Hutterite doctors, some of whom became famous far and wide. Dishes as elaborate as this one were most likely produced for outside customers, rather than for use within Hutterite communities. This piece is dated 1629. Another view of a former Habaner settlement, Pulich. The plants in the foreground may well symbolize the herb gardens maintained by the Hutterites. One of the handwritten medical manuals out of the Hutterite community showing specific plants and their healing powers. The Hutterites were so gifted that leading European doctors often came to visit Hutterite communities to add to their knowledge. Two people who have helped greatly in the rediscovery of Hutterite history and culture were Dr. Josef Hoforka from Olomuc, Olmuc, and Hermann Lansfeld from Straznice, Straznic. Hermann Lansfeld spent a lifetime excavating known Hutterite sites and became an expert in Habaner pottery and Hutterite culture in general. Shown here is one single tile such as were used to construct a kachelofen, a tile stove extending through the wall into two rooms for cooking, eating, drying, and general comfort. This example is sculpted and produced in a single color. Another tile from a kachelofen, this one glazed in colors. An example of an assembled kachelofen in the home of Hermann Lansfeld. The firing of such a stove takes place on the other side of the wall, in the much larger counterpart of the stove, shown here. Besides being producers of fine ceramics, the Hutterites were also known for making clocks, weaving textiles, and manufacturing fine cutlery. This axe head is one remaining example. Other known pieces are knives and two-tined forks. It is of interest to note that Hutterites refused to produce swords and other military-type hardware. Combs, like the one shown here, were produced from bone or from cow horns. The last forstair of a Habaner community in the former Czechoslovakia was Josef Bernhauser of Gross Schützen, Velka Lavare, shown here in 1971. Till the days of the communist occupation, these Habaners still maintained a communal lifestyle, but in 1950 were ordered to submit to the command of the new communist regime to disband. This volume, entitled 54 Good Reasons Why the Anabaptists Should Not Be Tolerated, one of several by Jesuit priest Christoph A. Fischer, contains much information, but also much malicious misinformation about Hutterite communities. The government used these volumes as a basis for renewed persecution. The government placed Jesuit chapels in the midst of Habaner communities, in this case, in an old renovated Hutterite building. Priests were permanently installed in the midst of the Habaner communities, and attending their sermons was mandatory. This led to interesting reactions. As the Habaner responded, What you read from the scriptures, this we believe. But what you said thereafter is pure nonsense. As the persecution intensified, the Hutterites tried to escape by hiding in large underground spaces, sometimes called Lochi or holes. One of these lochis exists today in Domboschitz. It is currently used by the owners of the land as a root cellar. This picture shows the lock, presumably made by the Hutterites. Looking from the inside out, we see a Czech woman standing at the entrance of the lochi. The hallway shown here turns a sharp left and leads to an underground space large enough to temporarily house the entire community. A Hutterian haushaben in Alvins, Transylvania, or Romania, existed from 1621 to 1767. It was made up of a Hutterite remnant 
which was joined by a small group of Lutherans expelled from Carinthia in Austria. In 1767, the Alvins, Vintu Deus community, was forced to flee to Wallachia and later into the Ukraine. Here we see the Murekul River near Alvins. The remains of the castle at Alvins. The owners of the land permitted the Hutterites to live there in relative peace for a century and a half. Once again, a chapel placed in the midst of the Hutterite community. Another view of Alvins. In Transylvania, the Hutterites again engaged in producing quality pottery that was marketed far and wide. A characteristic of the Transylvanian pottery was that it was often produced in a dark blue glaze with additional design in white and yellow. This shows a plate made in 1731, a crock undated. The market regulations of Alba Iulia, Romania, refer specifically to the New Christians, that is, the Hutterites and their wares, pottery and cutlery. One more look at the Transylvanian countryside, and a typical mode of transportation even to this day, a wagon drawn by oxen. Forced to flee once again in November of 1769, the Hutterites moved to Wallachia, where they lived for about a year, before moving on to Vyshenka in South Russia. Of great help to the Hutterites was the Mennonite settler and agriculture expert Johann Kornis. Kornis was known as an innovator who introduced many species of livestock and fruit-bearing trees in particular. He encouraged the Hutterites to again take up their communal way of life, helped them to find the land to do this, and taught them the art of farming in an area where they could no longer earn their living as artisans. In 1874 and the years following, the entire Hutterite community migrated to North America, along with thousands of Russian and Volhynian Mennonites. Hutterites were persecuted because they refused to baptize their babies and because they separated church and state. Men and women were beheaded, drowned, had their tongues screwed to the roof of their mouth or cut off, were burned at the stake or sold as galley slaves. Children were beaten or chopped to pieces to demoralize the parents. Many were tortured with red-hot irons. Groups were locked in houses and set on fire. Many were starved in dark, vermin-infested dungeons. Hutterites did not resist or retaliate. One adjustment to brute force was to die a willing death as true followers of Christ. This brings the European phase of Hutterian history to a close. What is a fitting conclusion to this unique story? The Hutterites have existed now for almost 500 years. What has held them together all these centuries? In 1577, Forster Peter Walpot said it as well as anyone could have before then or since, when he wrote these words, first in German, Dann so wir von unserem Schöpfer ein presthafte Natur empfangen haben, die für sich selbst nichts vermag, ist in dem unserem Nutz geraten, auf das unsere Presten und Mangel seien geistlichen oder zeitlichen Dingen durch brüderliche und freundliche Beiwohnung Hilf befinde. Und darum was einem mangelt, durch das anderen Hilf unterstützt und der Stadt werde. For since we have received from our Creator a defective nature, which is capable of achieving nothing for itself, it turns out to our benefit when our infirmities and shortcomings, both in spiritual and temporal things, find help through warm, brotherly living together, so that what is lacking in one can be supported and complemented through the help of the other. These beautiful words describe the Hutterite vision and faith at its very center, characterizing what it means to be Hutterite. 
a lofty vision indeed, that all Hutterites may look up to as worthy and God-given, to be lived out in community and witnessed to throughout the world.